Chapter 8 Intentional Electromagnetic Interference or IEMI So far we have been dealing with uh, EMC issues where the source occurs naturally either due to natural phenomena or due to the inherent nature of the equipments uh, that we use interference created by equipments or by lightning but it is also possible to intentionally create electromagnetic fields with the sole purpose of disturbing sensitive systems this can be done by rogue elements in the society or even enemy countries so this chapter will deal with some of the special issues related to that type of a scenario the outline so first in module 8.1 we will look at what is meant by IEMI, what are the main characteristics and how intentional EMI is different from the normal uh, electromagnetic interference issues and why it is such a concern now. Then after that in module 8.2 we will take the critical infrastructure. Uh, critical infrastructure means uh, you know uh, in society power lines, communication lines, uh, economic infrastructure so everything that is required for the smooth functioning of the society because often for the rogue elements this type of uh, critical infrastructure is an attractive target so we will look into what are the special issues related with that and uh, talk about uh, the mitigation philosophy applied to IEMI First of all, what is meant by intentional electromagnetic interference? It is uh, often defined by this uh, following quote Intentional malicious generation of electromagnetic energy introducing noise or signals into electrical and electronic systems thus disrupting, confusing or damaging the systems for terrorist or criminal purposes. So here there are several elements to it. First of all, uh, in IEMI there is a component of intention. It is something not uh, that just happens. It is intentionally created. So that itself uh, introduces several challenges. We will see that then the sole purpose is not any useful purpose it is for disrupting confusing or damaging these systems so it is not just accidental then uh, the idea is to create chaos in into that particular system or particular uh, establishment now an un unintentional emi uh, that is uh, usually taken care of uh, legislation and standards and uh, we have seen uh, EMC testing and standards in the previous uh, chapter and uh, we have seen the different principles uh, that are used in uh, uh, protecting the systems so unintentional EMI are usually taken care of by this type of measures and uh, say for example if any product is marketed in European Union there are European directives requires the CE marking that you can see in the products and other international and national standards on EMC are also available in all countries then when it comes to aircraft you have much more stringent condition for EMC because of uh, the catastrophic consequences of EMC uh, e EMI into aircraft so there are special directives for civil aircraft issued by civilian aviation authorities including uh, protection against lightning one of the severe electromagnetic disturbance that you can find in the aviation circles so all this will take care of unintentional EMI now when it comes to intentional EMI 
you know, it is still developing the regulations and other things. And often it is so difficult to make regulations because uh, often uh, it is the intent that creates uh, these problems. So in civil scenarios, uh, it is often denoted as uh, automatic terrorism uh, because it is for terrorizing the civil society that uh, sometimes uh, you know this type of issues comes and uh, you know, the levels of EMI are usually much higher the threat levels are much higher than uninitial EMI because there is an intention behind it so it is much more complicated uh, to take care of international EMI situations using the normal civilian standards. So that is the focus of these uh, modules. Now, why uh, the reasons for society's increased vulnerability to IEMI? So why society is increasingly vulnerable to IEMI? So there are different reasons for that. So we can look at these reasons from, let's say, from the victim side or looking from the source side. So from the victim side, we can see that uh, society is extremely dependent on interconnected electrical and electronic system for its function. This was not like that uh, several decades ago. Uh, now, Imagine in advanced societies, if there is a power outage due to certain incident, you know, widespread power outage, then uh, when power is gone, communication systems will die down soon because battery backup will be gone. Then uh, water distribution system, transportation system, all of them are dependent upon power and communication uh, or uh, financial transaction systems. So you can imagine a scenario in which there is no power in the society for you know, several hours and all the systems can be uh, you know, disturbed. And since uh, modern society, especially in the Western societies, these systems are so well functioning that you don't often have backup. Uh, normal homes or normal business establishment don't have backup power generators because uh, uh, power outage is such a rare phenomena. Then increased use of sophisticated and sensitive commercial off-the-shelf electronic for critical equipments. Now, uh, several decades ago, uh, often in critical equipments, there are specially made components being used, made for that, and one can harden these systems as one wish. But uh, due to the pressure to reduce cost and other reasons, uh, often now, you know, commercial off-the-shelf equipments are used for even for critical systems because you need so many systems and uh, it is often uh, easier to buy those things uh, rather than make specifically for those applications. So these systems are tested against a normal EMC in its uh, normal environment. So they are not really meant for withstanding industrially created EMI. Then miniaturization of components uh, make it that uh, even lower level of signals are used in the system and uh, you don't require that high levels of disturbance to penetrate into a system for destroying it. Then EM, legal EMC requirements for civil products are in general insufficient for protection against IEMI because uh, you don't expect such high levels of source. Uh, maybe civil aircraft is the only major exception to the rule because there you specify such a high level of uh, uh, EMI, you expect such high levels of electromagnetic interference that uh, civil aircraft 
can withstand usually IEMI scenario. Now, on the source side, you know, th th this is kind of a dual system. When the society is becoming more and more dependent on interconnected uh, electrical and communication systems for a smooth function, terrorists and other criminal elements are more attracted to us targeting those type of systems. Uh, so there is a motivation for them to do that. And often uh, they can do this uh, type of attack anonymously because uh, you don't leave any trace behind uh, unlike other type of uh, uh, sabotage. Uh, electromagnetic sabotage doesn't leave that much trace behind because it's just a transient event. And more components are available that can be assembled to homemade sources. Even a microwave that you use in homes has a powerful uh, source, a powerful microwave source, uh, which coupled with antennas can be made as a crude uh, electromagnetic weapon. And there is a lot of uh, information in the internet and expertise is widely available nowadays. And even commercial high-power EM sources can be just bought off the market, like used radars and other type of equipment are freely available, which can be converted into weapons. Uh, coupled with this availability of sources and the anonymity that IEMI attack often provides uh, becomes more attractive for the criminals to use those uh, type of uh, methods. Now, oh, a biggest concern regarding intentional EMI is critical infrastructure for various reasons. You know, if, if you have a small device with a well-defined boundary that can be measured in sub-meters, I mean like a cube or something, you can encase it in uh, steel armor or, you know, shielding uh, uh, and uh, such protection components, all kinds of uh, EMC mitigation methods we have used. Just increase the specifications and you can have fairly good protection against IEMI also. But that, that's not possible with uh, distributed infrastructure. Say for example, if you take Sweden, this is a map of Sweden, uh, many of the critical infrastructure it spans the whole country, that is more than uh, thousands of kilometers, and they are all interconnected radio, television network, traffic control system, food and water supply, telecom, power, financial system, computer networks. So if uh, power and telecom is targeted, often the rest of these things also will die down. So they are all interconnected. And uh, the sources can be wielded by criminals, competitors, you know, if it is uh, kind of industrial complexes, uh, you know, disgruntled employees. There were cases like that when disgruntled employees were trying to sabotage their own uh, factories or business establishment, protesters. Uh, then uh, even military adversaries, you know, because IEMI does not leave much trace behind and uh, then uh, even without declaring a war one can target uh, you know other countries infrastructure so these are the issues now we have seen this uh, classical picture from before the basic decomposition of an EMC problem so you can have a source and you can have a victim and there's a coupling path in between source and victim. So two is the coupling path, three, four, five are, you know, the victim where you have this front door kind of coupling, then internal coupling and the system response, etc. Say for example, a source has to be defined, for example, frequency envelope, power, polarization, angle of incident, etc. And one of the basic tenets of uh, EMC 
uh, I mean, EMI mitigation strategy for achieving EMC is that we know something about the source that is going to happen in that equipment's normal environment of use. So, so we have some idea about frequency envelope, power, polarization, angle of incidence, source characteristic, etc. So this is a basic assumption. With IEMI, we don't know, we can't be sure because, uh, you know, it can be any source. Then coupling paths of electromagnetic energy, whether it is near or far field coupling, properties of the medium, whether it is conducted coupling through cables, etc. We have some knowledge. And uh, receiver boundary, uh, what are the apertures, filters of the equipment, etc. Internal coupling of the receiver, uh, whether things are really radiated, what are the absorbing materials there, ground planes, this knowledge we have, and response of the component, how the system will respond. So this is we try to understand all these uh, five elements in a normal EMC scenario. Even in IEMI, this is the same strategy that we will be using. So there is no difference in the approach. The only thing is that uh, we need to have some extra thinking to be put into those. So this we will see with an example later uh, in later in the module too. Now, comparing IEMI to normal EMI issues when aiming for EMC in an IEMI scenario. So let us look into that uh, and try to see what are the difference between normal EMI and IEMI situation, industrial EMI situation. First of all, regarding the source, uh, in normal EMI, we assume that we know something about the source in that particular environment. But however, in the IEMI scenario, it is very hard to estimate the source characteristic because we don't know what kind of source the perpetrators will be having. So unconventional internal sources are continuously modified. So you need to have a uh, continuous evaluation of the threat perception based on uh, freely available technologies uh, in the society. Then in normal EMI we have a fair idea of the coupling path. Say for example if you have a building and if there is a lightning happening to the building we know that okay it is the, the air termination where the lightning will be attaching to. But of course, you can have lightning type of pulses that can be generated in uh, equipment. I mean, at least uh, small lightning can be generated by small equipment. And if these type of things are directly injected into a cable uh, coming into the building or a power socket outside, then of course the building is not designed for that type of uh, source appearing in that type of places. So you can have many unconventional coupling paths because of that. So unexpected ports for injection of disturbances. So this is a big challenge in the IEMI scenario. And therefore the physical and electromagnetic topological boundaries do not coincide. Say for example, uh, uh, you know, uh, perpetrators can come into a building with the powerful sources uh, unless there is uh, a possibility that uh, these type of sources can never into that uh, uh, area. Suppose if electromagnetic topologically we, we have defined zone number one like that and defined what are the sources inside zone number one and if we don't have a physical boundary for that then perpetrators can bring in sources more powerful into that particular zone. So this is what you meant by that physical and EM topological boundaries do not coincide because you don't expect 
a lightning type of pulse directly striking inside a building whereas in the IMI scenario it is possible to do that I, I'm just giving an example it can be some other source not necessarily lightning then the philosophy of using codes commercial of the shelf so that uh, uh, equipments are tested for specific environments where normally it is meant to be used and it, uh, it may have very little in common with the eventual IEMI environment because the normal codes equipment when used in a place where you know it, it is not uh, an attractive target for perpetrators then of course uh, it will function in, in that environment but when it is used in an environment where someone is targeting with an IEMI source then it will not function So the challenge of internal EMI, uh, we have seen that uh, the main difference uh, between EMI and IEMI is the intent. And because of this intent, it is very hard to predict what your source will be in a given uh, situation. So this picture you have seen, what are the possible spectra, the possible uh, EMI spectra. Now we have to say that the, the world spectra can have the potential to be used for IEMI attacks. So it can be even injecting a DC current into a ground, a telecommunication ground to create disturbance. So here in the spectra, uh, you know, you have this lightning spectra, you have normal EMI environment spectra. 10 kilohertz, 1 megahertz, up to few megahertz you can have. Then you have HEMP, nuclear EMP, the high altitude electromagnetic pulse that can go up to few hundred megahertz. Then you have now other type of sources used in military and other uh, scenarios. For example, you have narrow band high power microwaves and uh, high intensity radiation fields. So they are basically short bursts of sinusoidal pulses at uh, you know few gigahertz if you take the frequencies. So it will be very narrow band you know like uh, very targeted kind of band. So military systems use this. There are HPM weapons used by military uh, in destroying uh, enemy systems and all. So these are narrow band system. Then there is another type of uh, uh, pulse, ultra wide band. So the more definition you will see in the next page. So ultra wide band is also a big concern. So as the name suggests, it is a it is a impulse wave, not sinusoidal, but just an impulse. And the impulses have got very wide frequency band. So frequency band can be of the order of hundreds of megahertz for this. And uh, oh, they may not be of extremely high power compared to HPM, it may be of less power. But then uh, attractiveness of this as a IEMI source is that uh, it can excite uh, several, you know, frequency bands in the equipment where it can introduce some resonances and all. So with uh, with HPM and all, it is just one narrow band and if you know, oh, if you strengthen those narrow band, protection against those narrow bands, then of course your equipment is saved. But with the ultra wide band, it exposes the system to extremely wide frequency range and unfortunately there can be some frequencies where the system may go into resonances or it may be susceptible. So this is one difference between EMI and IEMI, the intent. So the world's frequency spectrum is open for IEMI. Then compromise of zoning concepts. Zoning principles may be compromised. We have seen uh, in chapter 5 what is the electromagnetic zoning principles. 
like say this is zone zero where EMP and lightning and all kinds of things may happen then inside you expect that these uh, uh, shields and other uh, interference diverters will reduce the the intensity of the sources to certain level so you have some idea of what these levels should be then again to sensitive circuits you have uh, another zone zone 2 0 1 and 2 so there it will be even less but this uh, is workable with the naturally occurring EMI and normal equipment EMI but if uh, uh, suppose this is a big industrial complex and someone is entering with a source hidden then immediately you are uh, you know breaking this uh, to, uh, uh, electromagnetic topology kill zone boundary because uh, there is nothing uh, preventing that person from entering with the source inside so one can come to the most sensitive part of uh, the facility and uh, you have a source that is totally unexpected. So compromise of zoning concepts is possible in the IEMI scenario. Topological and physical boundaries do not coincide. You can have unusual port of entry that normally you don't expect and unexpected source characteristics. So all these things are possible. Then this is especially a big challenge for large distributor system like railways because if it is an industrial complex or an equipment you can have this zone boundaries like this I mean to, to some extent equipments it is possible you can protect well against even with a physically limited industrial complex you can try to have some sort of say like a nuclear reactor complex you can have some kind of a control but uh, completely distributed system like railways, power, power systems, communication system, etc. It is more difficult. Now we see some example, unexpected port of entry. Uh, this is uh, an example of a control center, uh, automatic control center for, for uh, railways. Uh, you know keeping track side equipments you have an antenna on top of this mast for communications etc and cables going into the building so nicely constructed building with the shield uh, cladding inside no windows there's a perimeter fence so access is very difficult etc but uh, at the same time perimeter fence is mainly for keeping out animals and the people straying into it, you know, out of curiosity, not meant for someone determined to get into the thing. Say, for example, you can easily uh, scroll into using this uh, through these gaps, etc. Then, once you come to the building, you have equipment outside, power sockets outside, you know, power socket outside, and uh, uh, the building is uh, on top of pillars like this so you have all kinds of cables coming inside so it's very easy to access the cables and power sockets outside but in the normal EMC scenario you don't have to worry about it because you don't expect any these are just for convenience this power socket outside for cutting the grass and other maintenance things but if someone is injecting a high impulse into this then it goes into the sensitive system inside distributed in the inside or uh, the, through the cables it can be uh, you know impulses can be brought inside so th th this shows the the unexpected port of entry in the case of IEMI scenario now uh, there have been experiments conducted that experiments are reported uh, in these publications to see the ability of differential mode ultra wideband transients to penetrate deep into a facility ultra wideband have extremely large frequencies um, and uh, uh, so often it is thought that okay it will be dissipating very fast 
but not necessarily if it is in a differential mode. Differential mode is uh, more like a transverse automatic mode with very loss, very low loss. So it can really travel a long way compared to common mode where most of the energy is radiated out and dissipated. So this is uh, from a generator, differential mode signals uh, that is injected uh, in a building uh, outside in a power socket uh, between phase and neutral or uh, between one of these conductors and the earth wire. Then you see uh, how it is propagating inside. After one meter of propagation, you know, you can, uh, you have this particular level of voltage and after two meters of propagation, this voltage it is attenuating but not uh, fast enough so you can penetrate deep into the facility with the differential mode or provide band. So what is meant by ultra wideband signal that can be quite attractive for perpetrators for IEMI purposes. So th these are uh, transient signals. So this is an example taken from this thesis. Um, that can have rise time, sub nanosecond rise times or even nanosecond rise times and fall times of the order of nanoseconds. So here it is time. So this is 10 nanoseconds, 5 nanoseconds. So within few nanoseconds the pulse is over. So this has got extremely wide band. So you can see that this is uh, of the order of uh, 10 megahertz here, 100 megahertz here. So you can have, yeah, if, if you take, uh, you, you can have several uh, hundreds of uh, megahertz in bandwidth. So sub nanoseconds uh, or nanoseconds rise times and nanoseconds fall times, unusually large bandwidths of the order of 100 megahertz. So due to this large bandwidth, it can excite several uh, vulnerable uh, frequencies uh, within the victim. Now, uh, HPM are more narrow band. We have we have discussed that before. Uh, high power microwaves, you know, short burst burst of sinusoidal waveforms, separated in time. Uh, so they are quite narrow band. Now, HPM has been you can have extremely powerful sources with HPM. So HPM sources and its ability to do physical damage on common systems, unprotected equipment, say for example cars, personal computers, etc. has been done in this publication. So this table is taken from there. So they have seen that if you have an HPM band, so a 10 megawatt source, because they are quite huge, 10 joule energy capacity, um, so then, uh, yeah, you know, well, uh, you don't come close uh, to a critical system, but say, so suppose you are 50 meter away, then it can create permanent physical damage. And 50 meters, it can do upside, upset and damage. Uh, and 500 meter, also it can create upset and damage. So this may be one can recover from it or one can after some time but when the source is on uh, the system is not available. Now HPM suitcase so in a suitcase it can penetrate much deeper into the facility so in the, to the close vicinity it can come so the source is uh, at least uh, thousand times less in power but um, still uh, you know, a uh, hundred times less, but still, uh, 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 you can have uh, permanent physical damage in close vicinity, and uh, it is a threat up to several uh, you know, tens of meters. Uh, then, similar kind of uh, effects can happen with uh, ultra wide band or high power micro, uh, microwaves uh, 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 systems. Um, 
but permanent damage likely requires very high uh, pulse repetition frequency. So th this, uh, so, so th there were several tests done like this on equipments uh, to see what could be the possibilities and uh, it is known that it is possible to disturb systems by, uh, you know, uh, sources that can be carried in small briefcases, suitcases, 8.1.